Is there a organization of that and for a good how can we modernize and hold on to the past? Is that possible? Is that a good thing? Do we want to modernize and hold on to the past? For something. That comes from anything. Yeah. Is it, is it possible? And if it were possible, we you want to do it. Good thing. Are religions declining or growing? Are we are religions? I think we should start. Yeah, let's start. Yeah. Are religions a bad thing or a good thing? I'm saying that. What other questions? What's the difference between dipping and justification? And is there a third thing? Like a successful integration within a family. But I feel like it would have happen or that it's essentially two communities that are like not necessarily have a thing trying and something being broken up into it, but it's just two communities like changing. And one of them is usually the one that's positive, the other one's the negative What's this? Yes, I'm right back. Is that a thing? But did that? That's not what I technically is. Well, I'm talking about yeah, kind of how let's let's listen to what Joe has to say. I'm talking about more the idea of how you kind of label kind of the same thing as either like an empty situation or a situation of gentrification, where it's still like it's like if you're like breaking a new community. Let's say let's talk about shamans. The show Who sees shame the shameless a useful reference point for people? And what I think. Oh, it's it's frighteningly real. Yeah, it's still real. So who's who can tell us what shameless is all about in terms of the neighborhood in Chicago? <laughs> who saw that part of it? It was about like the lower Chicago. Yeah. Was it Chicago? I might be getting mixed up with the pair. Is this Chicago? Is Chicago? Okay. So can we can we cut the chatter? We're in class now. Thanks. So when this family in Chicago, huge family, and their neighborhood is a poor neighborhood. And it starts to gentrify. What do they do? They trash it. There's a nice fence, and they spray it with graffiti. There's a nice new garden. They trash it up. They throw garbage to prevent it from being gentrified. So that's NIMBY is something that happens when once the neighborhood is gentrified, then we use Sony. And we use legal proceedings to prevent any further change. So it's usually phases. First, poverty, then because of housing pressures, gentrification. And then once we gentrify the neighborhood, then we say no more changes. We freeze it. Not in my backyard. Exactly. So in that context, what's your question? Um, I think my question is. You labeling, you labeling people coming in as certification and saying that it's that thing. I don't think that that in much difference of a person saying, I don't want to keep going back. Right. It's a, it's a working class news in a way. That's yes. what you're saying. But again, I think that's the point. Yeah. There, are, there are basically two approaches of the same operating system. Yeah. Yeah. Of the operating system. 
It's like one of them is one of them, but it's like like when you like when you see like a yoga a yoga studio in Brooklyn, everyone's like, look at this degradation. You know, like obviously that's hilarious and stupid. And yeah. then the people in those are like, I don't want a fucking thirty story pile in my backyard. And you're like, no, no, no. That, that, I don't think those like those are like similar like, so situations. Just a person saying, right. I don't want to change. It's also the socioeconomic status of the person speaking. Like, I don't want gentrification in my neighborhood. I don't want a uh, 30 story tower. I don't want affordable housing in my neighborhood. That's my neighborhood. I'm trying to, I'm trying to think right now if it's, if it's, are you saying that it's like someone who makes less money should care more about their, like, I'm like, I don't kind of recognize that. I think a person who makes probably nothing, who is now mad at justification, is still going to be like, that's stupid. And then if I make 85 grand a year, I say that's stupid. It's the same comment. Well, the, the person uh, in Shameless living in a neighborhood uh, struggling to make ends meet, living paycheck to paycheck, one sick day away from being homeless. There's a lot more to lose. So okay. you better believe I'm going to fight like hell to keep my neighborhood affordable. Well, he's just going to go work. He's what? His whole life is just going to work if he's one shit. Yeah, so I don't have time to fight City Hall, so I'm kind of doomed to be speeding all the time and real estate market. So I'll just move further out, spend more time getting to my job. That's what happens. It's not necessary. That's how market forces, that's how the operating system moves in the United States and specifically because we don't build enough housing to keep up with demand. So gentrification is a byproduct of that. And gentrification is only gentrification if it displaces people. There's another phenomenon called gentrification without displacement, which basically means, and that's the Nubian square model, things are getting better in our neighborhood, but I, we're not being threatened to be displaced. Our rents are, are, we're protected somehow. Are there mechanisms for protecting current community from being displaced as things get better? That's the goal of Nubian square. Uh, so there was enough housing for if there was no housing, gentrification would still happen, but it would be in balance. There would be some neighborhoods moving up, some neighborhoods moving down, and there would be options. You would have, like, let's go back to Brooklyn. Uh, when uh, Manhattan, when uh, Greenwich Village got too expensive, people uh, squatted in the lofts and sell up in the settlements. When Soho took off and became too expensive, People went to the drug infested neighborhoods like me, like the Lower East Side, and went to architecture school being there, taking their lives in their hands. And then when the Lower East Side it to be safe, it still looks horrible, but it's very, very expensive. Then uh, there was Williamsburg in Williamsburg in Brooklyn, and that got expensive, then there was Dumbo, and then et cetera. It just keeps moving out. Now you gotta live in the place. You're gonna take a job in the place. And it's a long longer and longer commute. So these things are intertwined. Portable housing and automobile uh, dependency are very much intertwined. But, but in any case, I, I just want to highlight that even if you have, imagine in a perfect world where you have housing for everyone, we can argue that that even in that case, gentrification will happen. Because you will have differences of of a spatial opportunities in different neighborhoods. So, and there is some research made on one of the sponsors in my work by a few years ago, I don't remember the name. He was studying the, the, the long disease in different communities, mm -hmm. and he overlapped the map long disease with with shortage of trees. Right. Because you have less trees, you have more environment, environment are more contaminated, you can have more long disease. And that basically coincides with the red line districts, the, the, the red part of the districts. So they're basically under uh, underinvested areas. 
So you can imagine that you can have housing everywhere, but people will be gentrified less uh, to where they have less opportunity, less space health conditions, less public spaces, less trees, less connectivity, and so on. So we still will have differences. It's not only about housing. Well, it's not only about houses. Right. It's about also the asset you have. And I love your question because it cuts right to the heart of Jay's lecture and uh, the challenges of the design professions, um, which has to do with uh, the larger operating system of markets. It's the definition of a properly functioning operating system when things change. If people are going to, neighborhoods are going to get better and more expensive. Some neighborhoods are going to get more affordable, and people are going to be moving back and forth. If, as long as there's some sense of balance, then the market forces are actually doing what they're supposed to do. The reason we love markets, who loves markets? We love market forces because it's magic. It's the invisible hand of markets that maintains a homeostatic balance. Until it doesn't, until there are larger structural forces, there are all of a sudden the cost of housing becomes disconnected for the first time in history from incomes and people's ability to afford housing. So now you have a profoundly dysfunctional uh, set of forces operating within the market system, and the homeostatic balance is thrown off. Who hates markets? The reason we hate markets, the reason we love markets is it works automatically and restores balance. No one has to uh, change the thermostat, it just works. The reason we hate markets is when they don't work. When they are out of balance, they create distortions and they create significant harm uh, to communities of people and to people's lives. They shatter people's lives. And so what should we do? Should we say, oh, that's just nature, that's just natural that markets, you know, some people die, some people will lose, some people will become homeless, some people will lose their health coverage and die in the streets. Is that a natural force or is that a choice that we have? And that's kind of the, the core question to a lot of how these systems work and what is the role of architecture in the operation of the system. Mm -hmm. So keep your questions coming. Okay. These are great questions. We're going to try to give you your money's worth, as we often do, as we try. We always try. Um, okay. I keep trying to touch my screen because I spend so much time using my iPad. So if you're following this course, and we hope you are, you will recall that we started in the future and we're moving back through history, through a chain of questions. What's up with that? And how can it be used to help us in the year 2050 when everybody in the room turns to look at me because I'm, it's 2050, everyone turns in the room and looks at you because you're now the boss. You went to Wentworth, uh, you're supposed to have the answers. You're the architect. So everyone's gonna turn in the room and look at you and say, what should we do? And when that happens, what do you wish you had learned way back in the summer of 2024 that would help you respond effectively? Can you imagine what would be useful to learn? So that's how we're teaching this course. You may have noticed we're going back in time. You, you may also notice it's very different from the way we did history theory, where we started with a lot of the things we're going to look at today. We started there, and we learned about Greece. We learned about Egypt, right? We learned about 
Rome, you can read about all these places and the architectures. And why were we even looking at that? He said, why, why did we study Greece and Rome, Egypt, and Egypt? Because all our cities are there. Yeah, so we're going to look at that stuff again, but now from a, a sharper perspective that from, from the perspective of a young design professional who desperately needs to have the answers when every eye in the room turns towards you. What are you going to do? Are, where are the answers? We're going back in time and we're looking at this question, way back at the beginning of recorded history, what possible answers could lie in this historic material that could help us in the year 2050? Well, our operating, our working hypothesis for this class meeting today is that there are lessons in these early historic cities that are relevant to us in the year 2050. They're relevant to us long before we get to 2050, long before you're the boss. You're going to need this information. You're going to need access to these lessons. You're going to need it in your professional lives. You're going to need it for those of you who are going with the thesis program. And you're going to need it the first week in September when you're in Studio 7. Because the overlap between what you will be doing in Studio 7 and this lecture is significant. So let's go. So we, two weeks ago, we looked at this normative theory of, of city formation, looking at the city as a machine. We looked at Rome and other gridded, machine-like, very, very simplistic geometric patterns where cities expanded almost on their own. Once you lay out the grid, market forces take over. Uh, one design fits every parcel and brum, the island of Manhattan fills up with tenements. The United States fills up with towns and roads and farms because there's a grid. Every parcel is identical to every other parcel, which means it can, it can expand and grow and develop almost automatically like a machine. Then last week, we looked at a greater degree of complexity uh, that we use the word organism. It's organic or emergent. There are, it looks like chaos to most people, but when they call in the architects, the architects are able to identify the forces operating under the surface. When uh, Islamic cities form, it's basically because of the rules of social engagement, of privacy, of how the family structure should work. What is the proper relationship between man and God, man and nature, humans and other humans? I should be using humans, but I'm using the historic language. Uh, and so those rules are very fine grained and close to the ground, and it produces a high level of complexity. If you're not a designer, you don't, it just looks like chaos. When you look at informal settlements, self-produced communities, chaos, utter chaos. It's absolute, there's no logic to it. Uh, let's call in the architect. Let's call in new guys in the year 2050, you're gonna get the call. Hey, this looks very complex to us. That's why we're calling the architect. What are the rules operating underneath all this complexity? We looked at the, the, the starlings, the swallows, the bird formations, and we speculate that there are certain rules. If you're on the outside of the pack, you're gonna get eaten. So you're always trying to go to the middle. That consolidates the form. And if the bird next to you gets too close, adjust. And so those two rules are enough to produce this form, this dynamic form, which looks absolutely chaotic uh, from the outside, indecipherable, but because we're architects, we see it as a set of complex rule, a complex, a, a complex adaptive system. 
And now here we are, the city as a cosmos, uh, looking at uh, indigenous science or indigenous knowledge that is a vehicle of another degree of complexity. So when you go to Bali, and I think you will, you will see these bamboo shrines in the rice fields. And you will say, oh, how precious, how wonderful that I'm here just in time because everything old and religious is gonna be displaced by gentrification, by tourism. My visit here to Bali is a part of the problem. I'm spending all this uh, tourist money and it's going to destroy these religious practices of these poor, simple people. They're gonna get cell phones and motorbikes, right? Who's with me? Does that make sense? If you have, do you ever have that feeling? Well, if you're going to Hawaii, maybe uh, that's true, but if you're going to Bali, don't worry. They're doing fine, thank you very much. Uh, you're walking through the rice field and you notice these shrines, there's one here, there's one there. And if you walk upstream, to where the branches of the water occur, you notice that at every time the water branches, uh, the channel, the water channel branches, there's a shrine. And if you go upstream as the water uh, gets more and more, more and more flows, the shrines get bigger. And if you keep going upstream, you're gonna reach a mother temple where there's a lot of people uh, worshiping at this temple and you have all these offerings. This is not a major holiday. This is just Tuesday. Every day, everywhere in Bali, women mostly get up and they spend three or four hours each day creating these uh, little offering baskets. And they have this mapping of their houses and their family compounds where the circulation paths cross where there's a doorway, where there's a, uh, a powerful location in the architecture, they place an offering because these forces are converging and that's where you put the offerings every day. And literally it's three or four hours a day of labor by the women of the household to create these offerings and put them in the right place. This is to sustain the complex eco spiritual landscape of Bali, where all the water comes from the sacred mother temple at the crater at the top of the island, the, the volcanic crater, where the nutrients from the volcanic eruptions are taken, are delivered through the water systems to the rice fields. And so all the nutritional value and all the wealth of Bali, one of the most densely populated areas on the planet, they're able to sustain their rice harvests because of this complex irrigation system that is managed by the temples. If this were, uh, the, if, if this operating system were like ours, what would happen? It's predictable enough. You wanna take a shot? Yeah. If, if the water at the top is the source of all value, who would control it? Probably a corporation called the CIA. Fake water. Fake water? Big water. Big water. Big water. I like big water. So big water would take control upstream and they would sell water downstream. And they get extremely wealthy. The poorest people would be at the bottom of the uh, distribution system, and they would be out of luck, right? So there would be this operation of market forces that is totally natural, where the wealth would be upstream and the poverty would be downstream. So what do they do? They don't do that. They do the opposite of that. They organize the distribution of water through their system of temples. Every year, the priests get together and they arrange uh, to, for proper sharing to maximize the, the benefits to the most number of people. Imagine that. 
And for thousands of years, it has worked. In the 1960s and 70s, we had something called the Green Revolution. Uh, international scientists and uh, aid organizations pooled a lot of money, went to the Philippines, and they developed new strains of rice, new farming techniques that allowed farmers in the Philippines, instead of growing two uh, crops of rice every year, they were able to get three. And I don't know if you're good at math, but some of you will realize that that's a 50% increase um, of my income as a farmer. So fantastic. We're going to eliminate poverty in rural agricultural communities throughout the world. They did it in the Philippines, worked fantastically. They did it in Thailand, Malaysia, throughout Southeast Asia, fantastic. They came to Bali and they said, let's do this in the 1980s. And so um, the first year they had a little bit higher yields. It, they also did this. They said, listen, you guys plant as much and as often as you want and whenever you want. And whoever grows the most rice, we're gonna give you a prize. So they established this competitive system which took over from the cooperative system. So they were no longer consulting with the priests in the temples about when uh, and what to plant. They were cut loose by the Indonesian government. And the second year, the, the rice yields went way up. The third year went up again. The fourth year, it got kind of, they kind of broke even. The fifth year, there was widespread pest outbreaks and uh, a dramatic drop in the rice yields, uh, impoverishment and starvation. Thousands of Balinese died from starvation because of the failure of the rice yields. So the scientists panicked, they got together and they're trying to figure this out and they're thinking, let's do more uh, pesticides, more fertilizers and more advanced rice crops rice uh, strains. But the Balinese people said, nope, we're going back to our water temple system. And that's what they did. And uh, they were covered in year seven, year eight. I was, uh, I had typhoid and I got stuck in a village in, in Bali. And all around me were all these people speaking English with American accents. And I found out they were computer scientists from the University of Southern California. And they were sent to Bali to try to model the complexity of the system, uh, of the traditional system, to figure out why the Green Revolution failed so dramatically and why the traditional religious system was such a success. Basically, when uh, the priests were controlling when the water was supplied to who, they were keeping down the pests. If everyone planted their rice at the same time, if it was coordinated, then the pests would flourish, but then they'd uh, bring in the crop and the pests would have no food. And so they never got out of control. But when the Green Revolution came and they, they lost that synchronization, there was always a, a food supply for the pests. So they would feast on this rice field and then they'd fly off and feast on that rice field. And there was never uh, never a shortage of something for them to feed on. So that's why it failed. That's something that the scientists totally missed out on. And it took years of computer scientists and anthropologists. Stephen Lansing uh, was, was the lead thinker on this. And he's since published all about complex adaptive systems baked into indigenous knowledge of the Balinese system. So it turns out, so this is a working hypothesis at the core of this idea, this lecture, that indigenous knowledge sometimes is much, much more sophisticated and much more effective at managing complex natural human and natural systems. So complex adaptive systems is a term we hear uh, whenever we talk about sustainability and how to manage the landscapes. And 
It turns out that these religious uh, practices, these indigenous sciences are perfect, perfectly adapted, perfectly evolved, complex adaptive systems that have evolved in tune, in harmony with natural systems to optimize the outcomes. Uh, his most recent book is basically trying to uh, model complexity uh, in a way that should be very familiar to us as architects. Because one, and this is part of the hypothesis of this lecture, what we do as architects is manage complex adaptive systems. Right? Yes. Is it necessarily a bad thing that we're striving to like these different like systems? No, it's a good thing to strive to improve. The bad thing is to use oversimplistic, according to, to this author, in the 20th century, we became very, very good at saying this is an engineering problem. We look at it in simple mathematical terms and the mathematical modeling, he's talking all about mathematical modeling, tends to be linear. And so if the problem that you're solving is a linear problem, if it's simple, if there's one variable, not three, then it might, you might get away with it. But this hypothesis, as soon as you get like three variables into the equation, these linear mathematical models that we apply to everything during the 20th century don't perform well. For example, in our cities, we stopped designing streets and we turned over the design of our cities to transportation engineers. And they calculated with a very simple mathematical model. What is the most efficient way to get a car from point A to point B? Great. And there we and there we go. We did that very, very well. And it worked within the parameters of a very narrowly defined problem. Where that went wrong is evident to all of us. Uh, the problems of the 21st century are the direct outcome of the successes. Of the, uh, the problems of the 21st century are the direct outcome of the successes of the 20th century. We succeeded tremendously. We succeeded so much that it created its own unintended consequences that we could not predict because our models were too simple to take into consideration these larger complex interactions of the forces that's why when you take a class in sustainability, that's why we're always talking about complex adaptive systems. Yes, sir. So what you're trying to say is like the foundation needs to be good to build upon it. The foundation needs to be good to be able to like build upon that and the foundation isn't set well, then a lot of issues can go bad. So this is a, a house construction analogy? Uh no, I guess I uh, foundation is less literal, more like ideological. So um, the judgment of whether the foundation is sound or not <clears throat> has to take into consideration more than just how strong it is. It also has to take into consideration what happens when water. You know, there are all, now you have two variables. It has to not sink. It has to not crumble. And, but it also has to manage the water. So you get water in the basements, even when you have the strongest foundation system ribs, because there's a second variable. And then you get other things like differential settling. Uh, you know, so it turns out that if there's two or three variables, it very quickly becomes like the starlings, the cloud of starlings, it becomes very complex. And that's what we do in the design studio. We model it. And we say, what happens if I make this bigger? And then you model it. And if you're using, who's using Grasshopper? Is anyone using Grasshopper? 
he comes in the restaurant. He's a grasshopper. So I'm surprised there's not more grasshoppers. But that's what we do. We test multiple variables in relationship to each other. We don't just, we're not engineers. We don't just say we're optimizing for one variable. You say, this is too big. I'm going to make it smaller. Well, that's too small. I'm going to make it slightly bigger. That's just right. We're Goldilocksing everything we do. This is too tall. This is too short. It's just right. This is too much light. This is too little light. This is just right in the quality of light. Right? We are Goldilocksing every variable in relationship to every other variable. I don't know if you've ever tried to manage structural systems and electrical, mechanical, plumbing systems and the envelope system, all while you're trying to, have you ever done that? Well, hopefully once, by the end of a few weeks from now, hopefully you've done that. Um, but that's what we do. If, they, if there's only one variable in the problem, they don't call us, they call the engineers. But as soon as there's two or three variables and it's complex and we need a complex adaptive system, who are you gonna call? That's right, you're gonna call the architects. So the rules of the game in the 20th century were very simple and we still have these. Rule number one, let's go number one. Let's model that things that we value. Let's model it by putting a price tag. If it's high value, it costs more. If it's low value, it costs less. So that's rule number one. Rule number two, let's, let's measure the economy. Let's measure our success economically by how much money flows. If we are producing housing in a way that satisfies the demand, that counts, you know, that, that $100 billion of producing housing, that's, that counts, that's a good thing. We just invested $100 billion in the housing industry. If we go to war and it costs $100 billion, that counts, it counts the same. It counts the same. Bullets count the same as books. Education counts the same as war. There is no distinction between goods and services and bads and disservices. They all are part of growth, and the goal is growth. And when we encounter an externality that has unintended consequences, like pollution, in the normal operation of human societies, we would put a price on the pollution. We would charge people to bring things to the dump, but on a global scale. We would charge people to dump things into the water, into the air, into the soils. It would cost money. And the cost of dumping would be <laughs> part of the now multivariable equation that would be taken into consideration in this magical operation of the market. And things would optimize, there would be an acceptable level of pollution, but because there's a cost related to it, it would operate, it would be, there would be a balance struck. But something weird happened uh, in the last, during your parents' lifetimes, or at least your grandparents' lifetimes. Uh, we blocked any attempt to put a price on dumping things into the air, the water, and the soils. So much so that when you go to design anything uh, in wood in the building industry, the obvious material that everyone uses is ASAC trim. Does that sound familiar? It's what they made of. They don't say PVC anymore, they say polymers. There are polymer content. But what they mean by that is polyvinyl chloride. And when you produce polyvinyl chloride, it dumps polychlorinated biphenyls into water supplies. When you cut it, it puts 
uh, toxins into the air. When the house burns, it puts toxins uh, into the air. And when it's disposed of, it's poison. But since there is no cost related to using poison in the building industry, it's the best, the market has determined that it is the best solution for all construction in wood. And so uh, the, the, down, the, the end point of this is it doesn't, you know, we're distracted by whether people are good people or bad people, whether they're evil or, or saintly. I, my recommendation is don't be distracted by personalities, don't be distracted by these things. It's the rules of the operating system. The rules are such that whoever extracts and dumps the most fastest wins. They are become the wealthiest people in our society. And it's not so much that people are bad. No, they're good people. They coach Little League. They uh, volunteer at the church. But they're, they go to work every morning, and they're optimizing the performance of everything according to these rules. And that's why we have never once uh, in the last 50 years reduced the carbon emissions. Every year, the carbon emissions don't go up. I mean, don't go down. They don't stay the same. They always, always go up. These are the rules of the game. There's no other outcome possible. Instead, and you remember this video. So when you look at the world and you look at history of, of the last 70 years, 75 years now, this is what you see. You see the outcome of this operating system. And you understand that it's not sustainable. And it's not about doing slightly better or doing slightly less bad. It's about reversing the, the operation of these operating systems and do the opposite of what we have been doing. And it comes right down to architecture. These oversimplistic models have resulted in very negative things, so much so that the public housing project of the United States was largely abandoned in the 1970s. And it led Charles Jenks, a very smart guy, uh, to conclude that modern architecture ended at the moment that they detonated the pruitt Igo Towers in Missouri. And you've heard this before, we keep referring to it. And we get to this situation now where the Burj Khalifa happens, the tallest building in the world is not tall because of the value of the land, it's because of the necessity of investing in a single building to diversify the, the real estate, uh, diversify the financial holdings of the sovereign wealth fund of the United Arab Emirates. And in order to maintain the value of the real estate in Dubai, they perform these types of rituals every year. And the outcome of these operating of this operating system, uh, if we don't change it, is that that it will lose value. And but that's a long-term situation. You would think at some point uh, investors would notice that this is the outcome eventually of keeping this going. But it's not about the long-term outcome. Uh, we're lim Because of the rules of the game, we're limited in our timeline to 20 years. It's a 20-year timeline. And for many investors, it's really a one-year or, or one-quarter timeline. And so uh, they say that a capitalist will sell you the news with which you hang them because they're always selling. Even though they're about to get hung by a mob, they will do their best to sell the mob the noose that they then hang the capitalists with because it's a very short time frame. So the alternative operating system might look something like this. And this is informed by our study of the history of complex adaptive systems in architecture. It might look something like this. Look at the world as a series of nested systems then incentivize the striking of a balance. This is too wide, this is too narrow, this is just right. This is too warm, this is too cold, this is just right. That's what we do in the studio. 
That's what architecture does. That's what design does. And that's why design has become the new favorite problem solving strategy for all business schools, all corporations. Improvisation is the most important course that executives need to take in business school because they need to quickly adapt to complex changing situations. So when you look at these ancient cities, the flow of humanity from the, uh, the Great Rift Valley 200,000 years ago and the redistribution of, of humans across the planet and the complex societies that they, that they form, religion is a method of creating dependable understanding of the world. When we don't have science, we use religion. And even science has taken on kind of religious, it's a, it's a matter of faith for a lot of people. But the key thing that happens uh, when we look at the example like the Balinese Subak is these religious practices are keeping track of what works well, what doesn't work so well, and let's move forward based on that information. And so these these historic, these indigenous practices develop over long periods of time and develop towards a, a gathering of rules that strike balance, that actually incentivize striking balance, no matter how different, no matter what conditions uh, emerge. So if we look at these early cities, if we were still in history theory one, we would learn all about the Indus River Valley. We would learn about how their cities were formed, how their temples were formed, speculate on the archeological remains and all of that. This must be how they lived because we're architects, we can visualize it. Uh, but the thing that sticks out, and I suspect this is what you did in history theory one, it was all about water. When you look at Egypt, what's it all about? It's all about water. When you look at fill in the blank, the Yangtze River, uh, the Chinese civilizations, it's all about water. The Gutkun uh, reading kind of didn't see this point because it was written before water. Big water was the most was the new big oil. So uh, you know, of course, that oil was to the 20th century what water is becoming to the 21st century. There is something that we call big water. Who's from Maine? What's happening in Poland Spring with Poland Springs? Can you tell us? Do you know that story? They yeah. It's also well they did find a huge underwater aquifer in the Sahel, under the ground. Yeah, I'm talking about how, like, we white guys are feeling the man. Right. Because at this point, Well, it's not just the land, it's the water. Right. And I, one of the Quantum of Solace, the Bond movie, that kind of was premised on the, the water is the new oil. Um, and so when we look back, when we when we get when we ground ourselves in the perspective of the year 2050 and we look back at history for useful things the things that stick with us are things like this um this would be a good moment to raise your eyes slightly over the top of your laptops just for a second i won't i i promise you can put cam you can put your eyes down again in a minute just just glance at the slide. Okay, now you can look back at your laptop. Oh, you you're looking at this slide on your laptop. <laughs> it's so hard to be. It's so hard to do this. We are twenty twenty four. So for nothing after, but they already passed this class. So, oh, yeah, I was just saying, I mean, <laughs> yeah, yeah. so what's the deal with this diagram? This is a, a, 
You know, of all the things we can look at in the history of these ancient cities, civilizations, and their architecture, it's this landscape strategy that would dominate it in the Indus River. It dominated in the Nile River Valley. When you go to Cairo, and you will, this is the big story. The entire population of Egypt exists within this narrow band within a few kilometers of the Nile River. It's, and this is how that operating system works in relationship to the physical design landscape of that operating system. So this is more reinforcement of the idea that operating systems are connected at the core of every operating system in every society is its architecture, its landscape design, and its urban design. So uh, we look at these systems and we try to figure out what's going on. We looked at Islam. This is at the heart of, uh, of the Islamic religion. Literally, when I pray five times a day, I have to face this cube, the Kaaba. Kaaba. And uh, are these things gone and forgotten? Is this just interesting knowledge? They're embedded in the core of our cities. Um, and the way the Hindu model works is this is uh, a, a sacred palace complex at the core of the Hindu uh, city system. And it's a model of the universe. When something goes wrong in one part of the realm, you go to that part in the model, in the palace, and you perform certain rituals, and it restores the balance. It has an impact on the location uh, outside the walls of the palace. And this is how Hindu cities worked throughout the history. And, and it was a model of the cosmos. Um, there are societies that still thrive uh, in the world today because they've isolated themselves away from the rice growing and industrialized cities of their region, of their countries. So these societies are minorities in Burma, in Laos, in, in all of these different uh, nation states, but they are a unified peoples that cross the boundaries and they're still living in, according to these indigenous sciences. I had a friend who visited uh, Java and sent back this photo. And based on this photo, I had studied Italian. I was gonna go to Italy. I was gonna study the cities of Italy, but I switched gears. I studied Indonesian. I got a three month grant. When the recession hit shortly after I graduated from architecture school, I had a backup plan. I accepted a three month grant to go do research in this city in central Java. This is where it is. I used to do this for every site that we used to visit and I still have it. So just to set where it is, there's the island of Java in the country of Indonesia. And if we zoom into the middle of the island of Java, I get dizzy if I look at this. We find this royal city at the center and at the center of the royal city is the palace complex at the core of the city. This gate that I saw the picture of uh, is right up there. And I was surprised to find out that even though it's a very modern place, it didn't look like this when I got there in 1991, um, but it's a very modern place, but it still operates according to these, his, these religious principles. Uh, this is a combination of Islam, of Hinduism. This is the linga and the yoni, the male and the female genitalia that are venerated in the Hindu religion. Uh, but it's also an Islamic structure. Uh, and it's there's Buddhism mixed in there. And there's Dutch architecture. This is at one time the largest mosque in the world. Uh, there's a Protestant church, like a cathedral. 
Uh, so all the religions are here, uh, but this Hindu Javanese model of the palace of the universe is converted into the model of the palace in these steps. And so this is the palace that I encountered. Uh, my three month grant was enough for me to stretch to a year and a half because it's so cheap to live there. And I encountered uh, all these surprises. If you did the reading on Surakarta, you've heard the story, but it turns out there was a royal family and a palace that was crumbling. And uh, I became the royal architect or the king of Java. And we restored his palace with some support from the Aga Khan Award for Architecture. No time for this. And the surprising thing is they still use these rituals to restore balance between heaven and earth. It's like the Balinese subak, white buffalo, when they, when they defecate on the streets, the young men compete with each other to grab it and take it home because these sacred buffalo are defecating magic beans, basically, and they, they cure the problems in their rice fields. Uh, when, they, when the fire ran through the palace in 1985, they rebuilt it according to all the sacred uh, measurements. Uh, this is the king, he's driving a golden nail at the bottom of uh, the most important of the sacred pillars. Uh, they clean the cannon, the sacred cannon, and it's building. Only this priest and the king himself is allowed to see the cannon. And people, uh, as they sweep the water off of this building, uh, the people try to get the water in their bottles, and they pour some of this dirty, filthy water into their children's rice in the morning to make them healthy. Crazy. This... This crazy Dutch carriage is part of the Javanese religion now. It's cultural appropriation as a strategy. And so they embrace the European Baroque architecture in this palace, the Ottoman fez, the European brass band, the tuxedo's coat. Uh, one, one year there was going to be a Dutch colonial officer and the king was going to be at the same event and this very uh creative prince said well if the if the dutch uh governor general is going to be there i have to wear a tuxedo it would be disrespectful not to wear a tuxedo but if the king is going to be there i have to wear this sarong and uh this other costume how can i do both he put on the tuxedo he went to stick his short sword in the back that you need to have if the king is there and it made the tail coat flip out. So he had his ballet cut off the tail coats and that became the costume that everyone wears. It's a, uh, in history theory one, you dealt with the uh, phenomena of syncretism where different cultures are, are in hybrid formation with each other. Uh, do you remember syncretism? I remember your work hanging in the halls mentioned syncretism. Um, so this is extreme syncretic operation where all these cultural elements from multiple different places in the world come together. Here's again the linga, the yoni of Hindu practice. Uh, and uh, in a celebration commemorating the birth of the prophet Muhammad, uh, they're using these Hindu symbols, parading it through the palace so that they gather sacred energy taking it to the mosque, which is a hybrid architectural formation based on the Hindu pointed roof, the most sacred roof in Hinduism, was adapted to become the most sacred architecture of Islam. And this became the mosque form throughout Southeast Asia. It is a hybrid cultural formation. And when uh, the offerings are presented at the mosque when uh, all of that offering energy has been taken off. The people scramble and tear it apart because these are sacred uh, elements now. 
So uh, the grant we got allowed us to fix up the buildings where the Aga Khan Award Arch for Architecture was going to be held. But I insisted that um, it's not just about renovating the, the physical venue of this award ceremony. We need to restore the dignity and the value of according to the Javanese religious belief system. And so we asked the royal family what most needs to be repaired, and it was this tower. And so performing the proper offerings uh, and with the uh, priest, architect, master builder, uh, Asmo, who uh, we fashioned columns out of teak and repaired the most sacred tower. We did measured drawings, we performed all of the practices, and then we held the ceremony. This is the Minister of Culture. This is the King. This is uh, His Highness the Aga Khan. There's the translator uh, between the King and the Aga Khan uh, in my younger days. So, yes. How is Indonesian syncretism, or at least in the Sarakan, uh, how did this one go like the melting pot? So, melting pot. When you melt things in a pot, they tend to blend together. And you don't, you don't taste the separate ingredients so much, it's melted. And so uh, in other societies, we talk about a salad bowl where distinct elements are identifiable or, uh, or a, a mosaic. So you, be, you and I think we're less a melting pot now than we are a mosaic because we have uh, communities in the Boston area, very solid, distinct cultural communities that add to the richness and what it means to live in Boston, what it means to live in the United States. Its value keeps growing because of the diversity of uh, the inhabitants. They don't disappear into nothingness. Um, we speak the languages of our grandparents when we arrive in the United States. At home, we still speak Tagalog. We still speak uh, Spanish or Portuguese because we're from Brazil or Latin America. And so we don't, my mother, when she came to the United States, um, she spoke German growing up, but she protected us from even knowing that we were German. We had no idea that she grew up speaking German because of World War II. She was protecting us from our heritage. That is no longer how things work. Uh, we speak to our children in our native languages, right? In my case, yes. Yeah. So are you saying it's objectively a bad thing to hold this together? It's different uh, individual performance may vary. It's my blanket statement. It's tricky. It's a negotiation. At every step, it's a negotiation. Yeah, but that's we're gonna stop the class here. Stop the class here. Stop the class for all for the rest of the argument. I don't have time. No, I'm yeah. done. So I'm so, so let's shut it because yeah. it's a big talk. But the punchline is what we do in the studio is we negotiate complex adaptive systems. We adapt those complex systems as we design them. And they are designed to continue to adapt for the life of the architecture. And that is the model, that is the operating system that the world needs. We're already doing it, we've been doing it since the Renaissance. This is what architects do. There's a reason why Design is the new solution uh, to the way we approach problem solving in the world. And there's a reason why this education is profoundly valued, especially outside of the, the profession of architecture. It wasn't until I left the profession of architecture and had to work in other fields that I suddenly felt valued because I brought some problem solving methods to these situations that 
were extremely effective where the old way of doing things, the linear models, the engineering approach was not so successful. So this, I, I want you all to appreciate the value that you bring to the problem solving methods, to the problem solving arena of the 21st century. So that in 2050, when people turn to you, remember, you do have the answers. These methods will serve you well throughout your careers. So that's it. Thank you very much. What's his list? Last like so. So. Yes. Oh, you do let the things other than that. This is not his last. This is his The broken right this house. So this is common. I have to open the first. Are you sure? So I, I have. So I this incident was with Colin, but he's made I connected with WhatsApp, and he connected with the sun on the same moment. And and but this and while we are connected here, allows me to start with politics. I I I can just refrain. I only have thirty minutes. But I have one last question about this last lecture. Is we were talking about cities during the whole semester. The question is why why city exists? Why the society we decided in United we decided to use cities as a scenario for to build our our society. Do you have any idea why cities exist? Yeah. So let's start with. Uh, Calton? Yeah. No, Calton, no, no, Calton, you. Sorry, bring it back. Okay, sorry. Okay. Connection, you say connected. Calton? Protection, you say protection. Okay, that's good because I will start with, with the indigenous communities that were built basically because of protection. Yes, yeah, so should we start with protection? So, yeah, Kevin? I was going to say kind of the same thing, like survival. Survival from what? Like nature. From the wild. Okay, survival from the wild. What else? Why cities exist? Yeah, I have adaptation. For to what? Well, challenges from the past. Okay, adaptation from, yeah? Citizen Okay, there are several research that say that. So, no, but I want to start even without cities. I don't recall before the cities exist. So there are some scholars that say that we were basically going to the barn where you can we can store our food. That little piece of architecture changed everything, but we were able to store the food. So we were able to stay in, one, in, a, in a place instead of moving around looking for food. And then we were able to create one space, and from there we will protect it. And then after that, we were connected. So that, that is a process, but actually. So Juan Nuno, who is a poet, he said that we, we sleep in cities because we is the best place for us to exercise our freedom. We cannot be more free than any other place than in cities. He said that, yes, we have more connections to food, resources, and money, too, but also have connections to knowledge because universities tend to be in cities. We have connections to creativity, to innovation, but also to love, but also to, to, to passion. So we have more ways to connect things. I always say an, an, an anecdote. I used to work in, an, in the Amazon. I have one month once I lived in, an, in the Amazon forest for one year. And I was looking for one little guy, like seven years old. He was entertaining the community with little puppets made by Trunks, 
So he created their own puppets and he was entertaining the community from the all the all actors. So the tribes, the, 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 the community, the, the Native American community got gathered together in front of that boy and he heard the day all coming. It was really, really fun. And I was thinking, that guy has talented. In New York, he will go to Broadway. He should go to Broadway. But here in Piacoa, in the middle of the Amazon Forest, he should stay here to harvest today. It's the only thing that he can do. So the big difference is that if you are in the middle of the Amazon Forest, you have to do the same thing that your dads did. You have to do only basically the possibility that that community has. In a city, you have multiple things to share, so you are more free to connect your talents, whatever skills you have, to the system that makes this, that could make these talents valuable. So Juan Nuno says that these broad connections at the end is what makes us not gather, but to create city. I'm gonna connect the word that you say first, again. So we have agriculture, we can store food, so we can, well, because we can stay, we protect from the wild, and then we connect. In this process, Juan Nuno say is when connection happens. It's where we have cities. So where, where, where I'm showing here today, so some examples of, of, of communities, just basically to explain, or my argument or the hypothesis of this, of this lecture says, is that the community is basically the core of the city. It's where everything begins. So when you have the community that can gather because you can have stores of food, so you can gather in one place. This is where communities begin. So this is a, a research from Emmanuel Di Giordi. Emmanuel Di Giordi is a scholar from the University of Pavia, a great scholar research, uh, uh, studying about communities and how that produced different type of basically co-housing. So this is Tulu from Fuhan, China. It's a community that was created, that started uh, in the beginning of the humanity. So this is previous to the current era. So that they have these community that gathers around a center. So, and, the, and from outside, this is how it looks like. It's really uh, so, uh, close from outside. It's a community that built this massive building. There are currently four in three of these buildings built in China. They are currently uh, uh, part of the UNESCO heritage. So where from, from outside, they have this view. So and, and this is the section you can commonly you have the social areas, the, the, the living rooms, and the kitchen in the top. So you have each of these parts, it's a, it's a family. So the family owns a vertical piece of the building. So, and it's around 200 parts of the extended family. And this is, this is like a clan. So actually, in before that the city exists, the family was the main concept. When I say family, it's not, a, not necessarily the traditional family that we know today in the modern era, that like that and kids and dog. It's more a group of people that decided to work together or to live together in that uh, concentrated area to protect from the wild. So a family is 200 group of people gathering together in this huge building. Each one owns one of these units and, and they and in vertically they have again uh, social dorms and and in the kitchen. And that's the reason why you're from outside you only have these balconies in the top part because it's where the needs the part that needs to be ventilated towards the back, which is which is the kitchen, but from inside, you have this life. Everything is really open uh, towards the side and you commonly see uh, the, the, the community center in the, in the area and the dorms looking around. And in the center happens the festivities, the gathering, the celebrations of the community. Uh, obviously, actually, this is not happening formally now. So this is more like, like a fake celebration for a touristic reasons. So, but, uh, but it's, it's uh, and so you can visit these places that were used to be uh, the beginning of the seat of this of, of China civilization. So similar happened in the Umuzi, West Africa. And I go, I'm gonna go really fast. I have no time to provide all details for all of these cases. But basically, this is a community 
that is a, there are warriors that use that gather together to protect them from the wild. Again, Colton, you're right. And and there were many movies talking about this. This is the case of Sulodon. You can look at this. It's, it's, uh, they are basically warriors that gather together to protect from from the difficulties of 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 of, of, of Africa context and and. They were basically, they happen in many movies. In this one, The Kings of Solomon's Mines. I don't know if you have a chance to look at this movie. The most, there are like three or four versions of this movie. So basically, the Sulus, the Sulu tribes are looking like it, like the sense of the otherness, like something strange. Uh, and, and it's a beautiful movie because it's talking about how differences from these cultures is perceived as, as something that is not following the standards. Of the American values, and they're looking at so basically the movie connects the wildness of the of the of African territories with the wildness of the 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 other with the sense of otherness of this of this community. But the organization is basically this core where the cattle are in the center, and you have the set of huts around that protect the food, and then and then and then you have a boundary, a fence that protects from the wilds. There is always a centrality. Of, of certain civilization that looks towards towards the center. Um, and another example of something similar, you will see that it's a repetition of the same pattern, is that there are the matmata in Tunisia, that it, instead of having an stereotype, sorry, a tectonic hut, do you remember my lecture for statistics? They have an stereotomic cave to do exactly the same. So they have this cave, and this is beautiful because this is a really, really, Flexible. It's like a self-produced system. It, it emerged. So if you have one family, and when it, it extends, they have another wall in the hole, and they have tunnels that connect each other. So they will basically hit them in the in the desert, but extremely connected. So you have you can have extended families of two hundred or more groups gathering or protected from the environment, from the wild inside. So this is the piece, the the piece from inside. So, so the uh, the units are looking in the center where that they are underground, and this is the place where you meet uh, the community. Um, and and this is how it looks like from outside. So you, it, it, some of them are are hidden, basically you're protected from the wild. And this is uh, um, this is a Star Wars. I love I love that there are many use of this in, in movies. So I don't know why Tunisia is one of the favorite locations from Star Wars. But basically, what is trying to, to use these the same tools to protect from the empire. So these guys are so in, in this case, Anakin is in, in these inside this Matanza in Tunisia to protect from Darth Vader. So there are this this idea that protecting themselves from from the wild or from the bad. So and this is not Darth Vader. Sorry, this is not Star Wars. This is the real the real part. The other example is Marae in in New Zealand and. Um, so this uh, community of warriors, and they, they have this campus. It's like the Agora. Do you remember the, the discussion of the Agora? Of Greece? They gather together. The, the beauty of this case is that they have these buildings around the campus, and they always have a gate. And they said that is the main point of connection with the nature. So these are the, the New Zealand Marae. Do you recognize this dance? It's the traditional dance that they have. They play in all the old blacks play in rugby, and the beauty of this is it's a it's a, it's a it's a welcoming dance. So, but it's also at the same time is it's a dance for warriors. So, so there is always this connection between how celebrations connect with the wildness. So, uh, so because because you the nature have to have to have a. a, a, a uh, and a strange relation with the nature, because nature is what you provide you through, but at the same time, what provides you uh, disease and other and and, and and an animal that can hurt you. So you have this all the piece of relation between between loving the nature, but also having the need to be protected from the nature. So the outside is something that helps you, but also something that that can hurt you. So one of the most beautiful things in this community is that they have this hub where they have beds. If you're going there and you're welcome in the community, which is not that difficult, you can stay there. 
So this is a, a, a beautiful touristic travel to Hiroshima. You will stay with your backpack, and you there, if they welcome you, you can stay there. One of the best. They have the software. It's completely open. So, so something that is beautiful with these native communities that, are, that still exist is they are they called you relatively very soon after you stay with them for a couple for a couple of days. They start calling you relatives. Just your behavior of their relatives. So actually, if I, I when I worked in the Amazon, I was their parent, their relative, and I'm still their relatives. So suddenly I was seeing what's a group for them, and they said, "Hello, cousin. Hola, primo." So because I'm still their friend, their their relative, even if I'm here in Boston, because I live with them one year. So they understand that the the family very different. It's a family that extends. And it's more a communitarian thinking of, of the family. So my point is that the beginning of civilization starts with these types of, of close relations where you have hots, where you can come and stay. And, 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 and as I told you, they also have this gate that celebrates the nature, but also protects from the nature. This is this double side relation with the nature. So, and this is the Chabon in Brazil. This is where I lived in a year. Chabono is from a, from a, from a civilization, civilization South Venezuela, North Brazil, where the boundary didn't exist. They, they put the, the, the community is called Yanomami. And, and, it's, and, and, the, and, the, and, the, and immediately, basically, in this huge hut, pro, protected from the wild, where everything happens in the center. And actually, it's always very difficult to find the game. There is also something beautiful in that, that is connected with the, with the religious beings. There is a there is a, a, a god a, 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 a um, demon called Canaimo in Canaimo. That is a god, it's a devil that can be located, can locate himself if they found native degree scientists. So for that reason, you never find this this native degree scientist. Obviously, it's much more for build to build it could run to purpose. But, but if you, I, when I was working for them, my first proposal was to do this, because I'm an artist. Let's do this, the big plan. They say, no, you cannot do it. You, you, you can hurt ourselves, because cannibal will look around with two fish, they will get you. So cannibal is a god, but it's a deal at the same time. All together, it can help you, it can hurt you. So you have to, it's, it's, that is the nature, that is the nature. So I have to do this, <laughs> and everything was solved. So, okay. But they never time or never get in. Never get in. So, but you'll see that, and, and also that, the, so it's very difficult, difficult to find the gate and you have protected from inside because, because nature can get in. When I say nature, is a tiger, but also can it come. All of that is part of the nature. So, and this is, so this is a bigger hut. Again, it's very difficult. This is the, 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 the door. It's always very difficult to find. The, the area and from inside is very similar to the Tulu in China. So you, I, so they gave me this part and I, I, I put it in my hammock there. And I, so, and everyone was living around this huge field in the center and every, all celebrations and, and food happen inside and everything is a relative. So everything is it's relative, each other. So basically the, it's not that each part is a family like in China. Everyone is the family there. So, um, so, so, what are the learnings of this example? I, 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 I can I can have two takeaways. One is the huge ecology that is happening. So there's a close connection between nature and human beings. I don't know if you remember the first class that we were discussing that ecology is the relationship between organism and environment, which means relationship with the people and environment is part. Of the ecology, so this is a strong, a strong ecology that are, that uh, are nice from Dutch called deep ecology. There is a close connection. Everything happens because of the nature. I don't know if you remember that last week we were talking about the over nature, where we forgot the nature. We opened the faucet. We don't know where where, where that's here. These guys they knows where everything comes from because they are in close connection with the nature, and this is for good and for bad. And there is another another. Another takeaway here is that these, all of these examples, and this is the beginning of civilization, before that civilization starts, 
have a strong bonded connection. Everything look at inside. You have a boundary that protects from the wild. You have the agra protected in, with the boundaries. And of course, you, uh, this, this creates a strong connection with the community. I'm still cousin of these guys, even if I am not so strong. So, so you are, you are their relative forever if you live there. Okay, so uh, it's a strong bond within the community. So, but the, everything of this is broken after scientific revolution. So, uh, yeah, I, I, move, I move several years after, after in simple scientific revolution. And you guess why this is what broken? Why this type of civilization, civilization that look inside that is very welcoming, but you have to live inside within the community? Why this was broken? In the scientific revolution, the modern, the modern. Because individualism was like prioritized. Yeah. I agree. I agree. But why? They're trying to go with, like big money and be successful. Really yes, good. but why? They believe the the confines of the community. Yeah. Why? Why you can live alone? I know that you can. Why can't you? Yeah. Why you can live alone in an individual without being a community that protects. Because the wild is not wild anymore. So, with the scientific revolution, you have medicines, you have guns, you have technology that protects you from the wild. The wild is not, it's, the nature is not part of it anymore. It's now, it's our commodity. Because now it's a commodity, now we can control the nature. Thanks to technology, we don't need to protect them ourselves anymore. So, we can be in the life, we can be alone. We don't need the community that, that protects us from the wild. So that is, in my opinion, the big change, the big shift. So there is a guy called, a sociologist called Robert Putnam. He wrote this amazing book. That's, that is a great book, Bowling, Bowling Along. He said that now we're basically bowling along. He had a reading by Robert Putnam two weeks ago. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And we have uh, documentary films and what's that? Yeah. Uh, Robert Robert Putnam's idea. So he's saying that in the current situation, we cannot live in this ancient world, Native American world anymore. Because now we have cells of things that are spread out. We don't need to protect from the wild. He said we need to create social capital. And he said that the one of the problems that is happening is that the wild. I'm, I'm rephrasing that for the purpose of this class. It doesn't, I mean, it's, not, it's not saying it's not exactly what it works. But because the wild is not there anymore. So the wild is not there anymore. But we're, we're still having one connection with ours. So we're still having, we, in, our, so in our society, we're still having this strong connection with the different entities that sometimes are not really connected. But at the same time, we don't need to protect from the wild because the wild anymore, so that becomes individualized groups. But he says that probably to create network civic engagement, we need to add another forms of connection that he called weak connection. It's beautiful to say that you have a strong connection. That is a connection where you have with your mates, your friends, with yourself. And it is, but sometimes there are also weak connections, connections that we have with the other. Uh, I, I got, and, and I'm gonna give you an example. I have more connection with my wife than with the brother. But I have more connection with the brother than with gay. I have less more connection with gay than some guy that is walking in the street. So there are layers of bonding. And what Robert Putnam says in this book is that these layers of bonding is what makes networks. So it's a good connection to social support. So it's not only building community and strong bonding, also recognizing that good connections are important. It's important that I walk outside and I see someone that is not my fellow, it's not my mate. I don't love that guy as much as I love Robert. I don't care about this guy, but in even the state, I have a connection with that because we live in the same city. What he says basically is the importance of weak connections to create social capital. So because what is happening in the city is when you have an extremely a big amount of bonded connection, it could happen what, and I need your attention because it's a little complicated concept, this one. 
So this is Nasal Sajad and Ananya Roy. They say that you can have medieval modernity. It's being in the modern times that we live in the medieval times, where everyone was isolated and fighting. So we, what you say is that you can create form of citizens located in urban enclaves. You have isolated pieces of both connections that they don't have weak, spread out connections, that they don't have social capital. So what is happening, and, and this is extremely more complicated in the hyper society. So in the hypertextual society, because what is happening now, they have this phone here, and I can be connected easily here if my wife sent me a message, and I will disconnect from you. That happened with me, with you and I later, before, Colin. It's happening right now. It's happening right now. Colin, I send a message, I made that mistake, sorry. So I send that connection, and Colin and I will work on that here, while I'm disconnected from here. So that happened every time, now multiple times, and do multiple levels. So because we are having a strong, strong connection to social media and so on, we are missing the week that the more multiple connection happens in, in the real life. So what happens is, is, according to them, this medieval modern, uh, uh, modernity of, of part are completely isolated each other. And this is the beginning of wars, that is the beginning of, of, of crime and crisis of dispossession and so on. So it is the, according to Robert Conman, it's the core of, social, uh, 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 of, of the meeting of social capital that can help us to live each other in a peaceful, in peaceful and democratic environment. So what I'm trying to say is that the communities, the way we build communities in the past, with this bond, stronger connections, should be remains, but also flexibilized and create other, Robert Conman say, weak connections to create connections everywhere. So because this is the beginning of NIMBY as well. So this is the beginning of NIMBYism. So you have this strong connection that are, that are in one area. That we can imagine that in Toulouse, uh, in, China, in China, or in the Chabono in Brazil, or, 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 the, or in the Sulu tribe. Because the, but, but, what have, but, but what is happening now is now the wild, they are not the tigers, now the wild are the others. So what is happening now is that they live together and they protect from the others, and the others were snakes and animals. And now these same animals are someone that are different from us. And this is the beginning uh, of NIMBY that, that we propose to have, or why not Jimby? So, uh, what Robert would say, I have to change that while you were talking. That's a, that's a good thing to have Google Slide. So, but what Robert proposed is more a weak connection that we spread out and probably. Instead of NIMBY, we can have NIMBY. Let me explain that. Why not, not we are having not in my backyard, but this is not as bad as not in my front yard. So why, my problem, my question here is, when we have this environment, where things are connected, I can be, I have to be very prescriptive now because we are running out of time. So what makes this area that connects Different communities in order to have so in order to have weak connection is the public space. So what I'm trying to propose here is that probably a solution is not only changing NIMBY from GIMBY, but also avoiding not only NIMBY but avoiding NIMBY. So sometimes we can have there is no issue with having others in our, in our backyard, but you have to start being open to have others in the front yard. And this is where public space is a tool to mediate or to promote this uh, weak connection, the connection between differences. So this is my selection of some, some celebrations in Boston. You recognize these two guys? Yes, we played some time, we have fun together as well. So these are some celebrations in Boston and also some protests in Boston. So coming back to my first comment, uh, Robert, uh, sorry. Uh, what is the name of the poet? Juan Nuno. Juan Nuno says that we exercise, we exceed the existence because we have, we can exercise our freedom. And we can exercise our freedoms because we can have their spaces to gather with others. So, coming back to your question about we, how we can avoid gentrification, if every single place of the city has areas like this one, you can avoid gentrification. So, or we can not, or probably 
we can we can we cannot so we cannot um we don't have to be aware of our certification because every part could be over a space that have us opportunity to exercise our freedoms with sponsor celebration protest as well so and this goes back to my previous lecture or discussion about the agora and how democracy happened in the agora because and the agora so i'm looking at you Colton, because i know that you engage this up very well with your analysis uh so the agora uh was the space where we exercised the, 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 the democracy so this connection this that creates the city happens in public space and how this is now problematic now where the greed, these machines that is a city that spread out in a territory without having these spaces of engagement. So at the end, it's an issue of a scale. And that is one of the reasons because our democracy is in crisis. The scale of the democracy is in crisis because we are expanded so well in the 20th century that we're not having these public spaces for gathering, create connections or create weak connections. So, so yeah, we're in, and, and it seems that representative democracy is not being enough to create these connections between the others. So I'm putting that to remind me here that, that uh, as a reminder that I think it's a fact that our democracy is right. So you can you can have in your mind things that happened in the last week. I don't want to put in much, but our democracy is right. Uh, not only do we have, we have environmental crisis, we have uh, political crisis, we have a lot of crisis. Our democracy is for sure in crisis. So, because I want to be optimistic, I want to propose two ideas of two scholars that are now proposing ideas about how we can save our democracy. And these are these two guys, Jason Brennan and Elaine Landmore, uh, Princeton University. University and she's, she's teaching in Princeton University. Well, both these books, both books are from Princeton University. So I'm gonna explain both ideas, and you will probably we can both if you have any favorite or not. So Brennan says that. Um, by the way, Ellen Landmore was the reading that we had in the in week eleven, I think. About and she said that there is no decarbonization without democratization. The only way to save the war, the war and to save climate change is to think about new form of democracy. These are the two proposals. What the first proposal is against democracy. He said that the problem we're having in democracy is that now we have three types of persons. He described that we have hobbits. There are people that don't care about politics. They are they, it's the people that believe isolated and they don't care about they, they don't care about politics. But you have hooligans that basically people that sport strongly support one party and they consume things and in their career, they only have, I don't know, they are Republican, Republican, they only have Republican information and they believe that it's the only truth. They are Republicans. Or you have Balkans that, that, that knows everything, and, and but they disagree with everything. So rise your hand if you are on top obviously. You don't care about the Bible. Yeah. Rise your hand if you are a hooligan. You believe in one party, you can solve the thing that you have in one party. So that's the last thing. Right now, you're a bull gun. You know everything you say. Ah, yeah. yeah. Okay, so he said that you have these three analysis, and he said that these are not working for democracy. So he proposed something different. That is then what they call the epistocracy. That is saying we have to remove democracy, and we have to change the rules of knowers rather than the rules by people. So the problem that these people at the end they have no idea about it. They are proposing to come back to the idea of the well-known people dominates everything and you have a group that is real. He's proposing that. He's proposing that. It's a book that is always half or four followers. So basically you have people who know and they decide for us. The what, is the people that what can go wrong? Yeah, what is, yeah, what can go wrong? This is one idea. Against democracy. People, they have no idea what to do. So sometimes we have master plan, quality programs and design code that controls the most the life of the people. There's some kind of, of an epistocracy. The other option is open democracy. And but also she so not the more from Princeton University, she decided to challenge the representative democracy 
And because you say that modern parliaments usually have people that are, that are representing the well connected, but they're not representing everyone. So, and, and she proposed open the power to ordinary citizens. So you have a random selection of people that create the party and they decide for them. It's similar, but you select them random. And so, and it's a kind of return to the island. But to return to the island. So I don't know what is true, what is the third option, but not on my point that there are several scholars thinking how we can refrain through democracy because in some ways democracy is in risk. So and how we can have a mediation between participatory democracy and representative democracy. So the voice, and, and we can say about participatory planning and representative planning, how we can have a mediation between the knowers, people who know how to do a plan, and the people, people who want to exercise their freedom uh, to participate in their making the decision making. So, but what is true is that democracy is kind of dying, and we have to find ways to address that. I'm, I'm, and so I, I, I don't, I, I don't plan to read, to read this quote. I please, I invite you to read this quote. So this is a quote. My last quote, my penultimate verse, is is it's by, by Andre Gibb, this French philosopher. He said that he believed in the value of the minority, and the world will decide, will decide the field there. And we say that basically the intellectual integrity, young people like you, will save the world. I don't know if we're if we going to this property against democracy or open democracy. But we believe that you will have, you guys in this room, will have the intellectual integrity to find ways to use design as a tool to increase democracy. And this is not something that we'll, you, you will do in the future, it's something that you will do next semester. So, so next semester, we will be working in that location. It's an indigenous community, it's a Native American community, where Abenaki, Senaku, and Wanabaki, uh, Native American, still have traces. It's in Durham, in the University of New Hampshire. So we'll be working there, trying to find ways to understand how the Native American prefer to engage with the environment, or their preferences, and how we can introduce some design ideas to, to improve their life, but also coordinate their life. So it's, that will be to a stakeholders in the Danish agriculture. I mean, those who are not going to Spain. So the tension of the Native American and the tension of the University of New Hampshire, both working, both were fighting uh, for the land, for the last decades or, or centuries, and how we can create the design goals of the needs between both mediating to the needs of protection of Native American and the needs of expansion from the University of North. So, so I hope that some of the thinking can help you to, to face these uh, ideas or this project in Studio 7. So I have to run, Robert. So yeah. don't leave because now Robert will stay. I have a, I have a, I have to I have a meeting, but there are, there are two meetings here where Robert can answer any questions about the pro about the project. Then. So we turn press. Thank you. Thank you. So the the rest of the course is uh, we're going to have our our gathering next Tuesday, the way we always do. You have an analysis. Uh, and we're going to discuss it and diagram our analysis work. So, what should we be analyzing based on this uh, these ideas and what future engagement with indigenous communities in New Hampshire? Think about uh, what are the examples of indigenous communities uh, in architecture that will help us deal with these issues moving forward. Between now and next Tuesday, we also want you to uh, form groups if you haven't already. Uh, we want you to tell us who's in your group by opening the digital version of this document and adding your group name, names, names of the people in your group at the bottom of this document. Um, 
Then we want you to show up next Tuesday with a slide for your group. And it says here on this assignment that that slide should have an image of the place project area you selected, the name of the project area you selected, your group member names, and a paragraph that you write together to help you, members of your group, figure out what are the shared issues that define that project area, find the needs of the community, of what are the issues you will be dealing with as you move forward in the rest of the term time. Questions? Is it one slide as a group? One slide per group. It's, there's no bright space component to this. We just want you to put a slide in your class slideshow so that we can talk about it next Tuesday. Just the dressing issues, not what are the issues? Dressing issues, uh, which the way you describe the pressing issues, they, they hint at the approaches you're going to take, but it's fine. It's not too early to start talking about uh, what your individual interventions will be and where they um, But we want you to show up next Tuesday having a clear sense of not just that first step, but the following steps, uh, which uh, there will be a group discussion within your group. You will do readings. Uh, you will do an individual analysis. That will be very familiar to you. Then you will develop an individual principal paper described on page two. And then you will do a group shared approach, which will be uh, due on Brightspace on Tuesday, the 13th of August. So we meet as usual next Tuesday in our classrooms to do the thing we do every week. Then the following Thursday, we won't be meeting here. We will be meeting in small group uh, settings in the library. 